are extremely topical and extremely timely in that webinar. Um, as the situation in Iran heats up with this mysterious explosion over Isfahan last Sunday night, attributed by many sources, but of course not an official Israeli one to Israel, we're watching as the entire eight-dimensional fragile glass chessboard, which is the Middle East, coming into dramatic play. Um, any thinking person who is evaluating the possibility of an attack on any Iranian nuclear facility has got to take into consideration the Iranian terror proxy Hezbollah and its total um, domination of Lebanon. Lebanon is by any measure a failed state. It's supposed to have a government that's based on a sectarian power sharing system reflecting its very diverse religious populations at the time of its independence from France. Reflecting this, and according to the 1989 Taif Accords, which were supposed to end the Lebanese civil war, the three government positions of president, prime minister, and speaker must be split between a Maronite Christian, a Sunni Muslim, and a Shia Muslim. However, this is only on paper. Actually, Iran is the head of a toxic python, and its grasp is constricting the Lebanese neck and suffocating its people. The Lebanese government is rife with corruption and the Shiite terrorist proxy, or a quote, party of God, Hezbollah operates with total impunity. In reality, Lebanon is an impoverished state that never recovered from the August 4th, 2020 explosion in Beirut where millions of people are unable to fuel their homes or pay for the rising cost of fuel. This past Tuesday, Reuters came out with the report that Lebanon is devaluating its, or devaluing its currency by 90% with an official exchange rate of 15,000 Lebanese pounds per one US dollar. Um, the Taif Accords of 1989, the UN Security Council Resolution 1559 of 2004, and reaffirmed, uh, reaffirmed um, in the UN Security Council um, Resolution 1701 in 2006 clearly states that, quote, all foreign forces should withdraw from southern Lebanon. That includes the Iranian proxy Hezbollah which is by now by far the most dominant military and political force in Lebanon with um, approximately 150,000 missiles staring down at Israel, some of which have been converted into quote, precision guided munitions. Of course, the um, UNIFIL, the United Nations Interim Forces in Lebanon was supposed to patrol the blue line and basically contain or eliminate Hezbollah. We're honored to have with us here today to help us understand the complexities of the Middle East and particularly the failed state of Lebanon, David Shanker. Um, David Shanker is the Taub Senior Fellow at the Washington Institute and Director of their program on Arab politics. Confirmed by the Senate on June 5th, 2019, he served as Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs in the prior administration, the Trump administration, through January of 2021. In that capacity, he was the principal Middle East advisor to the Secretary of State and the senior official overseeing the conduct of U.S. policy and diplomacy in a region stretching all the way from Morocco to Iran to Yemen, with responsibility for 18 countries, the Palestinian Authority and Western Sahara. He also supervised more than 9,000 staff and administered an annual budget in excess of $7 billion. In policy terms, he led the Bureau's efforts to advance American interests abroad and strengthen US partnerships and alliances across the region. Via diplomacy and the effective um, allocation of resources and assistance, as well as through imposition of sanctions, he worked to promote human rights, deter terrorism, fight corruption, and push back against regional adversaries. Prior to joining the State Department, David worked as the 
Alcian Fellow and Director of the Beth and David Godald Program on Arab Politics at the Washington Institute from 2006 to 2019. He has authored dozens of op-eds, journal articles, and policy watches about Jordan, Lebanon, Hezbollah, and Egypt, among other topics, and contributed chapters um, to Washington Institute monographs. Um, I can go on and on with David's illustrious, illustrious bio. Um, he has um, uh, written a numerous um, scholarly journals and newspapers, including the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Jer Jerusalem Post, and most recently for Tablet. So David, let's begin with a little bit of intrigue. Um, UNIFEL um, has about, what, 10,000 troops in Lebanon, which you described in your absolutely brilliant tablet article as, quote, the densest presence of peacekeepers per square kilometer of anywhere in the world. Tell us a bit about the mysterious murder of an Irish UNIFEL peacekeeper. Thank you. Sarah, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, it's quite an introduction. I wish my mom was here to, to hear it. She <laughs> She might have actually believed it. Um, uh, it's great to be with you and Emmett. Um, so UNIFEL created in 1978, uh, had about 2,000 folks there. Um, it has blossomed uh, and grown the, with the best of intentions, actually. The, the, the Bush administration um, got through the UN Resolution 1701, which expanded the duties of UNIFEL, which was to patrol and prevent um, the rearming of Hezbollah after the the 34 day war with Israel in 2006. And to do that, uh, the number of troops has increased. Uh, the cap was actually set at 15,000 at the time. And uh, but they had something like 13,000 troops there today. It's about 10,500. And um, although they have yet, you know, in this what 45 year period to take a single weapon from Hezbollah um, or en route to Hezbollah, which is just remarkable given how many people there are and, and how quickly Hezbollah has rearmed. Um, uh, you know, this force persists. And so what they do, um, even though they are denied access by the uh, by Hezbollah, by Hezbollah supporters, by the Lebanese armed forces, to certain areas that are deemed private property. Uh, they basically do thousands of patrols a year in South Lebanon, uh, in small villages, remote areas, major roads, um, searching for whatever they're searching for. Um, this is weapons. Uh, they've come across you know, uh, shooting ranges for Hezbollah. Um, uh, when there are rocket launches into Israel, they go and try and investigate, et cetera. Um, they, they try, but um, they, they don't do very much or, or, or very well. They measure their, their success and, and output by the number of, of patrols rather than uh, the amount of, of material they discover or, or prevent from reaching Hezbollah. In any event, um, actually, th this was a, an odd case in, in late September. Um, it just so happened uh, there were um, two Lebanese, uh, sorry, two members of UNIFIL. Um, uh, this was the uh, you know, Irish peacekeeper and one, one other, um, who uh, whose members of their family, their immediate family, had died back in in Europe, and so they were actually flying home on a, a you know a, a, a leave that was you know sort of compassionate leave granted to them by their their military units to go visit their their families. And uh, there was a, a, a UNIFIL vehicle that was you know, driving north and uh, went through a certain village and was attacked. Now, it's not unusual for UNIFIL trucks to be attacked. This is becoming actually more routine. Uh, it's part of the policy of Hezbollah. Um, but they were attacked. The car crashed, turned over. They tried to pry open the doors, shoot through the windows. And they uh, injured several people in the vehicle and, and killed uh, an Irish an Irish peacekeeper. Um, Hezbollah, Hezbollah eventually turned over um, one of four or five people who were uh, named by the Justice Department. 
Um, either this is a sacrificial lamb or somebody who had nothing to do with it, but uh, th there's no accountability or, or justice in Lebanon. It's uh, all crime and, and no punishment. So I, I wouldn't expect any progress to be made on, on an investigation, a real investigation here. So what's the nature of the relationship between UNIFIL and um, the Lebanese Armed Forces and Hezbollah? Well, the, um, the mandate um, uh, indicates that the LAF, the Lebanese Armed Forces, um, which, by the way, you know, last year got something like $236 million from the United States, um, that the Lebanese Armed Forces is supposed to protect um, and conduct, uh, accompany the UNIFIL on uh, joint patrols, provide support for the organization, protect the organization, um, and provide them, uh, in short, provide them access. Um, but as we know, historically, um, the LAF does not um, oppose Hezbollah. In fact, there's a long history of deconfliction, uh, collaboration, joint uh, uh, joint uh, checkpoints uh, at certain uh, certain times. Um, the LAF actually provided um, artillery support uh, in support of Hezbollah ground forces fighting ISIS in Syria. Um, uh, uh, maybe what six, seven years ago. Um, so there, uh, and there are, you know, the the LAF itself is um, has people in the organization who are sympathetic or are are members of of Hezbollah. So there is infiltration um, and cooperation, and in any event, the the inability, uh, certainly the lack of will, but also the inability of of the LAF to oppose. Hezbollah. You, you remember the LAF is often described as a national institution. Um, whether uh, whether it is actually a, a functioning institution or or national is a, a question. Um, but what it is is um, uh, an organization that represents all of uh, Lebanon's sectarian makeup. And the last time this organization was asked to go against a particular uh, religious group, I think it was Sunni Muslims back in. Uh, uh, 1975, uh, the organization split along sectarian lines, and the military dissolved. Um, so it's not going to go against Hezbollah. The the only terrorists that LAF fights are Sunni terrorists. We're talking about Al Qaeda and and ISIS, um, but it won't do anything about Shiite terrorists, i.e., Hezbollah. Um, so th there is a, a relationship um, that is. Um, you know, deconfliction mostly, uh, some areas of collaboration, no friction between the organization. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's uh, the government of Lebanon, which is also bound by the UN Security Council Resolution 1701 um, and uh, to provide support to UNIFIL. And the kind of support that the government of Lebanon is responsible for is investigating uh, what is an increasing number of attacks against uh, UNIFIL personnel, uh, periodic murders, roadside bombs, uh, harassment, et cetera. Um, and I think just last year, there was, um, there was a sentencing um, for um, uh, a killing that took place back in, I think, 1984. Um, so the wheels of justice uh, you know, do not spin, do not turn in Lebanon. Uh, in this case, they, they turn rather slowly. Um, but in, in other cases, there, there's just no accountability whatsoever. And, and UNIFIL, the, the, the UN, has called out the government of Lebanon and uh, the Lebanese Armed Forces for their lack of uh, cooperation and support for, for the mission. Right. So how much control of the government does Hezbollah actually have? I mean, LAF, the Lebanese Armed Forces, are basically taking their command from the government. Well, not really, right? This is not civil uh, civilian control uh, of the military. Um, the LAF in the past has received orders from the government back when uh, the March for the so-called March 14th pro-West coalition that kicked Syria out of Lebanon um, back in what 2005, when they took power and had a majority government. Uh, back in 2008, in fact, they ordered. Uh, the military to uh, disassemble um, a dedicated uh, Hezbollah fiber optic uh, network that ran from uh, the south 
into Dahya, into uh, the southern suburb of Beirut, that where the Hezbollah's command center is. Um, they also ordered, the government ordered the dismissal of a Hezbollah sympathetic officer who was in charge of uh, Beirut airport. And the military refused both those orders. Um, that was too confrontational. So there's not um, civilian control of the military. Um, but uh, no, the, the government itself, um, you know, the parliament um, is, uh, you know, there is a, a, a significant number of, of uh, Hezbollah's the largest Shiite party. Shiites comprise a plurality, maybe 37, 38% of Lebanon. There are two Shiite parties, uh, Hezbollah and Amal. Um, Amal is basically an appendage of Hezbollah. Um, and they control more than a third, and with their allies, almost half, if not slightly more, um, of parliament. Um, the government, um, it's caretaker government right now. Hezbollah does not control it, but neither does uh, the government oppose in, in any meaningful way uh, Hezbollah. Um, and this is a government, as you pointed out earlier, a uh, country that is on the verge of, of financial collapse. Um, uh, can't take any any real decisions. But yeah, the government is highly influenced by um, Hezbollah, it takes no actions against Hezbollah, and in fact, um, has created through action or inaction an environment that uh, Hezbollah is extremely comfortable with. Right. So you mentioned that some members of the LAF are actually simultaneously members of Hezbollah. Um, does UNIFIL ever go into hot pursuit? of Hezbollah terrorists. We don't expect the Lebanese armed forces to- No, 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 that, that doesn't happen. I mean, there there are patrols. The patrols are there to report on Hezbollah, uh, on activity. And the reports actually generally don't mention very often even the word Hezbollah. It's like Voldemort, as I mentioned in my, uh, in my article. Mm -hmm. um, but they talk about, uh, and a lot of the sort of people that we know that are Hezbollah that UNIFIL runs across, are not wearing uniforms with you know patches so that suggests that these people are are members of Hezbollah. Um, they're plain clothes, et cetera. But they've come across others that are wearing uniforms who have threatened them that if they come back to that area that they will be killed the next time they, they come there. Uh, there's no hot pursuit. Um, when they see they ran across a, um, a shooting range, which is you know obviously totally uh, illegal. Um, per the terms of, of the uh, 1701, um, something the government of Lebanon is committed to, um, they report it. <clears throat> when they, they, they recognize that these alleged green without borders, Hezbollah's so-called environmental NGO um, that controls large swaths of territory right on the border uh, with Israel, and they're building um, these observation posts there that look into Israel. In fact, there's one very close to uh, Roshan Ikra and Matula, where the people in these towers are actually uh, putting lasers um, into Israel on, you know, drivers and cars, um, you know, harassing people across the border. Um, uh, UNIFIL has no access to these areas, and we know that these are, uh, are Hezbollah properties, and they say that they are private property. The government of Lebanon maintains their private property, and and, and so the LAF will not provide access. I've read that um, these lasers are blinding or maybe temporarily blinding people. And I'm not sure, you know, I, if the technology and um, of Israel has actually come up with any kind of solution at this time. Yeah, they're, you know? they're apparently lasing people back in these towers um, and this has a you know a, a, some sort of deterrent effect, but uh, this is ongoing. And right. I, I, I expect that you know, and they're they're uh, I think broadcasting threats from the from the towers as well into into Israel. Right. I know that you you wrote in your fabulous article and tablet um, that the United States government um, gives approximately two hundred thirty one million dollars a year to the LAF. <clears throat> Um, with all of this collaboration with Hezbollah, do you think, and it's supposed to act as some sort of leverage against Hezbollah, 
do you think we're getting our, our money's worth? I Actually, in Emet, we have had lobbied in the past to, to stop this aid because of the um, amount of collaboration that the LAF has with Hezbollah. Yeah, well, it's, you know, uh, listen, it's a complicated issue. I think there are uh, smart people in Washington on both sides of this issue. Um, uh, but Tony Badron, one of my friends, is uh, the thing said uh, the United States should end uh, the aid. He's over at FDD. Um, the government of Israel um, likes the United States to provide this support to the LAF. Um, uh, they support it because um, they don't want to see a total collapse of uh, public order in Lebanon. Um, uh, you know, there are cynical people out there that says, well, if the LAF fell apart, um, that uh, that ISIS would come into uh, into Lebanon, and then Hezbollah would have to fight ISIS. Um, I think that's a pretty cynical um, view. I don't think Israel wants another ISIS on their border. Um, but um, no, I mean, what what the United States gets for this, in addition to um, you know having this uh, force that does fight Sunni extremism, um, that and maintains some semblance of public order, which is, I think, increasingly important with the the financial difficulties and we can talk about those perhaps later um that um that the united states gains insight into what's going on in uh, in lebanon um and um some level uh of influence and connection with uh the laf now you can go back you can think um you can think egypt on this right the united states gives a billion a billion point three um you know we take it away some over time for human rights but um, to the Egyptian military, which has one of the worst human rights records um, in the region, right? Um, and Egypt is, of course, violating the security provisions of, uh, of Camp David by building um, uh, permanent military installations, including airfields in the Sinai. I mean, you know, and we still think um, that this is uh, an institution um, that to have a contact with this when the revolution occurred, um, a lot of these people had been through uh, the U.S. military institutions. We had connections with them. We could find out what was going on. Um, and we know personalities and, you know, periodically uh, can weigh in. Um, in terms of U.S. foreign assistance, um, it is uh, a very low number, 236 million. Um, it was a larger number this year because the United States, the Biden administration wants to pay some salaries like uh, stipends to the LAF and the Lebanese police force, the mm -hmm. ISF, um, because with the currency devaluation, which is now more than 95% devaluated, <clears throat> started out, you, you said it was 15,000, that's the official bank rate. Um, it started out at 1,500 pounds to a dollar. So it was a peg, right? Then it went to like uh, 3,000, 6,000, 15,000. That's if you go to the bank. Um, the, the black market, it's, it's now like 60,000 pounds to a dollar. Right, so people's life savings have been wiped out, and the people that are being paid salaries, you know, by the Lebanese Armed Forces, are making the equivalent of ten dollars a month. If you're an enlisted person, you can't feed your families. People are going to leave and go work on their family farms, and so the United States, the Biden administration, decided that they should get everybody hundred bucks a month in the LAF. Right, this is not going to feed Hezbollah. Right, this is not going to, uh, you know. You know, undermine Israeli security or whatnot. But usually the, the aid is, you know, 100, 150, 200 million a year or something like that. Right. But do you think, I mean, with the kind of um, indoctrination that Hezbollah has, um, I mean, I've been studying this for a while and I see how Hezbollah is actually very much a part of the boys' clubs, the girls' clubs, the youth organizations. Do you think $100 a month, $150 a month on U.S. aid is going to counter um, this kind of indoctrination? No, I mean, that, but that's not what the money was going for. I mean, uh, so I was back in the Pentagon in uh, 2002 to 2006 in the mm -hmm. Bush administration. I was in charge of Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestinian affairs, and right. Israel. Right. Um, big portfolio. Um, the Cedar Revolution happened. I advocated for funding the Lebanese armed forces, right? The Lebanese people, one out of every three, four Lebanese, um, you know, went to Beirut in the streets to throw the Syrians out of, uh, out of uh, and the Syrian occupation of Lebanon. 
And, um, you know, the army had gone into disrepair because it was occupied by Syria. Well, the only thing the army did at that point was basically provide security at soccer games. Um, and so to make them a, a more functioning institution, maybe uh, with the hopes that maybe they would do some work on the borders, maybe with the fights in the extremists, there was no illusions at the time that the LAF, uh, if made into uh, you know a, a, a high quality institution or a functioning institution, would supplant or fight Hezbollah. That wasn't uh, you know from where I was coming from at the time. That wasn't the argument I was making. I was making that if you want an argument that if you want to have stability in the country, um, that you didn't want to have a failed state, um, that you're going to have to have some element of public security. Um, but you know, going back to your your, your first question, whether um, whether we should get rid of this money, um, you know, my my argument, my view, as opposed to Tony Bagram, which says let's get the hell out of Lebanon, um, my argument is we should hold them to a high standard. And so if we know units um, of the Lebanese military are, are collaborating with Hezbollah, um, just like we do when there are units of any army in the world that we provide funding for, whether it's the Egyptian army or the Israeli army, if there's a unit that violates human rights, we stop funding them, right? We don't send them equipment. We, this happens with Egypt all the time, right? The State Department, the Paul Mill, um, uh, NEA, uh, DRL, um, we we cooperate and and, and ascertain uh, what unit did did what. Um, you know, if you know, remember a couple of years back, there was a shooting in uh, in Israel where an Israeli soldier shot a disabled, shot and killed a, a disabled Palestinian terrorist. Right? Um, uh, there was a judicial process. Had there not been a judicial process, the United States would have um, ensured that there was no funding going to that unit anymore. Right, right. right. But so I mean, we could do yeah. this with the LAF as well. Right, it should be right. With the LAF. right. And in terms of UNIFIL, um, how much money does the United States, well, it's, it goes through the United Nations. And as we know, America disproportionately funds the UN. So about what is the cost tab to the U.S. taxpayer in terms of UNIFIL per, per year? Well, you know, uh, given all the money that we spend, it's a, it's a pittance. But uh, it's a you know the largest force, the largest peacekeeping force in the UN, um, and it costs five hundred million dollars a year. And the United States pays a quarter of the UN peacekeeping budget, so we're on the hook for you know one hundred twenty-five million a year um, right now. It was substantially less when there were only two thousand troops in the country, but with ten thousand five hundred, et cetera, um, it's a, a costly mission. And uh, I think in this case, you know, while while I think smart people can can differ about uh, you know, the LAF, I think in this case, uh, you know, there's absolutely no added value by having 8,500 more troops. Um, uh, you know, uh, in fact, I think you know, the, this, the UNIFIL is more vulnerable with more troops on the ground. Uh, you know, they don't have um, intelligence units that are you know, providing force protection. They depend on the goodwill of the local population that's highly sympathetic to Hezbollah, if not members of Hezbollah. Um, and, um, and of course, when there is a war, when there is the next war between Israel and Hezbollah, which I think it, sadly is inevitable, notwithstanding this, uh, the Biden administration's brokering of this maritime uh, border uh, agreement, um, when that next war comes, uh, these people will be human shields. Um, and we've seen this before with Hezbollah firing from positions in close proximity to, uh, if not adjacent to, uh, UNIFIL bases and outposts. Yeah, as you wrote in your article, um, again, your excellent art article and tablet, um, every time defunding of UNIFIL comes up, the French say, now is not a good time, given that there's always like this perpetual chaos and conflict throughout Lebanon, will there ever be a good time? <laughs> No, there will, not, there will never be a good time. Um, you know, I, I, of late, I, I started saying that Lebanon isn't in a crisis. Um, it's not a crisis because it, this is a, basically the permanent state of affairs in Lebanon, right? They have a presidential vacuum for the past five, six months. At one point, they had a presidential vacuum for six years, right? All right? No president of the country. No, you know, there's a caretaker government. They haven't had governments for long periods of time. 
Um, you know, the financial crisis has always been, you know, bad. It's been a long, long time Ponzi scheme. Um, I think the French, you know, like the status quo. Um, you know, I, I go through, you know, how we tried to reform um, Unifil. Um, it was a very difficult um, affair. You know, there are many in the U.S. government. Um, uh, you know, I had uh, sort of fights with the International Organizations Bureau uh, at the State Department, which couldn't imagine that Secretary Pompeo would veto a Security Council resolution to renew the mandate, right? Uh, how difficult is this going to be? Uh, the secretary was perfectly willing to do it. Um, and we got to that point. Of course, I must say the Israelis didn't want to see um, a, a full veto of the organization, but um, were quite interested in what we were doing to try and increase the reporting requirements, uh, geographic locations, uh, you know, recorded, made public, um, every incident of violence and obstruction made public, but also downsizing the force um, to... Uh, to pre, you know, pre-2007 levels. Um, and we would have done it. I think we were, you know, well on the way to getting there. Uh, Kelly Croft was arguing for it, uh, the UN, uh, US ambassador of the UN. Um, you know, I was pushing it with uh, my, my, uh, my colleagues, my, my counterparts in foreign governments. Um, and then, you know, I was actually scheduled to have a briefing to um, all the, the perm reps of, um, of, of the UN, uh, the Security Council, um, at like two in the afternoon um, in early August of, of 2020 um, to talk about what we were, what we were trying to do um, with UNIFIL. And that morning, uh, the port of Lebanon blew up, oh. the largest you know, uh, the explosion since the Hiroshima, um, you know, uh, and even at that point, uh, you know, Secretary Pompeo, who was, you know, very supportive of this initiative, um, uh, you know, we just didn't, didn't have the heart. <laughs> it was, right. there were too many other issues. Um, and so we couldn't push it through, but I think, you know, given the, you know, the, where we are today, I, I think it's you know incumbent on the, the administration to pick that up um, and, uh, and and grab it. There is never a good time. Um, that was a particularly bad time. But there's never a good time. <laughs> right, right. Being that, as you said, Unifil often acts or has acted as human shields um, for Hezbollah. Why does the government of Israel want to keep Unifil there? Well, they do think that, well, certain aspects of it, certainly the, um, there are two things that Israel likes very much. One is, um, you know, the maritime patrols, uh, that there are, are ships out there. They have, a, I think, a, Italian vessels or uh, Brazilian vessels, uh, five ships. Uh, the Lebanese Armed Forces doesn't have a Navy, even if they, they have a couple of ships. So it, even if they did, um, that uh, wouldn't prevent Hezbollah from you know, going, doing things uh, at sea. I think that's productive. Uh, the other, you know, uh, is that there is uh, something called the tri, uh, tripartite mechanism, which is on a monthly basis, um, uh, Israeli uh, uh, officials, uh, the military officials um, uh, from the IDF and from the LAF uh, gather in Nakora with, uh, with UNIFIL to talk about the situation on the border. On the border. Um, and uh, this can play a de-escalatory role when things look like they're going to get out of hand, um, you know, uh, or when there's a specific incident that happens along the border, um, Unifil can play a role in, uh, the, you know, a range of communication between, you know, two countries that are essentially at war. Has it been proven, um, you know, the, these sorts of, um, the convening of, of the parties has proven evidentially to be helpful? Yeah, I mean, you can talk to, um, uh, there's a guy named Asaf Orion, who all of us know, um, a, a retired, uh, 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 I think he's a, just a, uh, maybe a brigadier general um, in, the IF, uh, in the IDF, who was responsible for international cooperation. He was leading the, the IDF. Um, in these interactions, and we said they were productive. Um, he, he supports it. Right. All right. Um, and with this, I want to turn um, 
the podium over to my wonderful um, colleague, Kusena Babakar Mansour, who will field some of the questions that have come in and perhaps pose some of his own. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sarah. And thank you very much for all our audiences who tuned in today and sent us um, our questions. Please keep sending us your questions through the uh, Q&A button on, on Zoom. Um, David, thank you for such a great presentation. We've received a number of questions uh, from uh, our audience. Um, some of the questions we received asking you to detail for us more, what is currently the exact position of the Biden administration um, on, on Lebanon? What is, is, is their strategy? If they have a strategy, is it different than it came before? Um, what's, what's this administration doing about all of this? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I don't want to malign the Biden administration, but I don't think they have much interest in Lebanon overall, not, not much interest in the Middle East. But uh, but certainly uh, Lebanon's not um, an issue like it was in uh, previous administrations uh, that I worked in, at least. So I think the Bush administration, uh, the, the Trump administration, Secretary Pompeo, myself, um, we view uh, viewed Lebanon as an area uh, to try and contest um, Iranian hegemony in the region, um, try and push back, uh, try and engage with people who shared our values, of which there are many uh, in Lebanon who have put their lives on the line and work with these people and try and um, undermine uh, what Iran and Hezbollah are trying to do. Um, uh, we had a, a strategy um, in the previous administration. Um, I think across the region, um, uh, particularly in uh, places like Iraq and, uh, and Lebanon, which are the front lines, I think, for confrontation, um, you know, pushing back on Iran and the region. Um, I, I think the administration is um, uh, taking a less activist approach uh, I want to keep the lid on things. I, there's something to be said for that, uh, um, certainly. I mean, Israel itself is not um, uh, pressing the issue in Lebanon right now. They're looking for, you know, de-escalation, et cetera. But, um, you know, they're, I think they're, the administration is hoping to try and um, encourage the formation of a government um, in Lebanon, the election of a president and a uh, a real government that actually can take decisions, uh, decisions like um, uh, uh, committing to and implementing reforms that would be sufficient for Lebanon to actually get an IMF program to stabilize a, the country. Because you've had something like seven, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand people who have left Lebanon so far. Um, uh, probably, if I had to guess, a uh, 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 plurality of them being Christian, um, you know, out of five million people. Um, uh, this is not, um, I think, in our interests, uh, certainly in the interest of, of Lebanon as a um, uh, uh, hopes for a moderate, uh, moderate polity and people with whom we share uh, values, um, nor does it uh, put any constraints on Hezbollah. There have been one round of sanctions. Um, when I was in government, we sanctioned uh, three top, I mean, in addition to Hezbollah, but three um, top uh, uh, politicians in the country, including uh, the president's son-in-law. Um, uh, the Biden administration, uh, when it first got, came in, did three more. Um, those were people that we had set in motion before uh, we left government. Um, but they haven't done uh, anything else since. Um, uh, the French pr pretty much have the lead role right now on, um, on Lebanon. Um, that, in my view, is not a great thing. Um, we, uh, the French, of course, have relations with Hezbollah. They're, um, uh, you know, they don't consider Hezbollah to be a terror, terrorist organization, et cetera. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't think we're really activists. I, I know in the, you know, the last, uh, administration, Secretary Pompeo was very interested in Lebanon. Um, he went there once, um, David Hale, the undersecretary, uh, the highest ranking foreign service officer in the, and the state department had been uh, previous had served in Lebanon twice was a, a US ambassador to Lebanon and of course before I went to government I'd go to Lebanon about three times a year um so I think there's a whole lot less um interest in the country uh, although I must say our, our ambassador Dorothy Shea 
um, who will be leaving this summer, uh, I think is is excellent. Thank you. Uh, we've received a question asking, uh, how do the um, negotiations with Iran over a new nuclear deal uh, affect uh, Lebanon at all? Um, are they, um, do they affect Hezbollah? Do they affect the finances of Hezbollah? Uh, does it play any role in, in what happens in Lebanon? You know, I, I think the, uh, I think um, in Lebanon, there are, um, the country is rife with conspiracy theories. Um, you know, it's not atypical, of course, of the region writ large. Um, but, um, you know, there's a view uh, that nothing will get done in Lebanon, no decisions to be made, no president elected, et cetera, unless there's a broad agreement um, between either Saudi Arabia and Iran um, or the United States and Iran. Um, I don't think that's true. Um, but, uh, you know, the Lebanese have long sought, you know, a, a country that would 17, 18 ethnic groups, minorities, et cetera, um, and minorities. Uh, you know, they uh, every one of these groups has sought protection alliances with external actors, uh, whether they be Western, regional, et cetera. Um, so, and there's also, I think in many parts, uh, you can read it on Twitter every day, there's a real um, I think reticence to take personal responsibility for what's happened in terms of the economy. Um, Hezbollah certainly bl and their allies blame me personally for the collapse of the economy. Um, you know, I designated one bank, uh, and I designated after Lebanon's credit um, uh, credit rating fell to a C minus. I, I let it fall before we we actually pulled the pulled the string on that. Um, uh, I designated the bank because we had been the United States had been working with the bank to clear up money laundering and Hezbollah accounts for a full year and they weren't doing anything. Um, you know, but, but this is not why the economy has collapsed. The economy has collapsed because there's been, you know, a long-standing Ponzi scheme, um, you know, and a, a peg to the dollar where if you had Lira deposits in Lebanon, you'd get 16 or 19 percent interest. You know, who's going to invest in your economy if you can make 16 or 19 percent on bank deposits? How do they pay for that? Right. I mean, so but there's no, you know, not a whole lot of recognition that Lebanon itself is responsible for the condition of Lebanon. Um, that said, um, listen, I, the JCPOA from where I sit is a uh, dead corpse. Um, you know, even though the Biden administration, Rob Malley and, and others still want to resurrect uh, this zombie, um, you know, you've got the administration, even if it wanted to, could not. Um, and it's, you know, on, on the one hand, there is, um, you know, the fact that Iran is basically slaughtering all these women who are protesting for their freedom and other Iranians who are protesting for their freedom. So you got the human rights on one hand. And on the other hand, you've got the fact that Iran is, is uh, actively assisting Russia to kill Ukrainians um, through the sale of drones and uh, advanced ballistic missiles. Now, the Europeans, frankly, um, could care less, um, well, let me be more diplomatic here. I'm not really being diplomatic. The Europeans didn't really have um, a significant problem with the Assad regime, uh, with the aid of Hezbollah and Iran killing nearly half a million Syrians, most of them Sunni Muslims, in what to me resembles a genocide. Um, they have a big problem with Iran helping to kill Europeans. Um, and so um, I think that even if the Biden administration made even more concessions to Iran to entice them into this deal. Um, Congress will not let them return to this deal. And the Europeans, I think, are now somewhat opposed to the deal. In any event, so much time has passed and there's so little time left on the JCPOA. We've got the end of the, the, the missile constraints. Soon after that, we've got the end of the, um, the centrifuge constraints and the enrichment constraints, um, there's very little value to getting back into that same agreement at this point. Um, so I don't think this has a bearing on where we're going um, in Lebanon right now. And uh, and it's an open question in any event, whether Iran could pull this string, you know, and activate Hezbollah to go to war against Israel. I think if there was a um, a, a real war, then we'd see it happen. But anything short of that, 
um, Hezbollah may have some input into that decision. Thank you. Uh, be before we move on to the other related questions, we've received a, a quick question. What, what is the Ponzi scheme uh, of the Lebanese economy? Would you like to qual clarify? Yeah, listen, you know, the, 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 short, the short story is that in the aftermath of the Civil War, the government of Lebanon um, took huge loans to rebuild the country. Uh, they got a lot of investment, real estate speculation, et cetera. Um, the central bank, um, to do a peg with the dollar, uh, 1500 lira um, and to maintain uh, high lira deposits in the bank would pay these exorbitant uh, you know, interest rates. Um, uh, Lebanon, therefore, there was no money. No, nobody would loan any money to, you know, to individuals, right? The interest rates are too high to take out loans to establish businesses in Lebanon. Uh, the banks became, you know, the primary, um, you know, the, the, the primary engine of the, the Lebanese economy. The central bank um, to uh, underwrite because they don't collect very many taxes there. Incredibly regressive, um, and nor do they, uh, you know, state-owned electricity. For example, Hezbollah siphons it off. Nobody pays for electricity in that country, and the government subsidizes, you know, what it uh, otherwise. Now nowadays, it doesn't really matter. People only get two hours of electricity a day, anyway, uh, or less. Um, but what would happen is the central bank needed money. It would borrow money from local banks, right? And then pay them back at very high interest rates, right? And, uh, and the, the loans were made possible by people sending remittances from abroad because a huge number of Lebanese are abroad sending back uh, funds to their families, would put them in the bank, they'd get loaned out to the central bank. Um, and these, you know, these banks didn't have necessarily the assets underwriting uh, the deposits or the the money that they were they were uh, giving out. Um, and so, uh, and every now and then, if these banks made bad investments, um, the central bank would bail out the local banks, right? And so, you didn't have any money to cover all the expenses. Plus, Lebanon's one of the most corrupt countries in the world, and so a lot of this money was siphoned off. And so. Um, you know, I can go into more details, but this is the broad outlines of the Ponzi scheme. Thank you. Um, what's preventing Lebanon from collapsing into another civil war? Um, well, there's still many people who are alive that remember it. Hmm. Uh, and the leadership, uh, what they call the Zulama, the traditional uh, elites and leaders, tribal sectarian leaders of the country. Um, these guys are all if you look at them, um, you know, old, they remember it, the battle days, you know, 15 years of, uh, or, or more of civil war. Um, they don't want to go back there. And so everybody is very, very careful. They make deals. Everyone's trying to avoid it. Um, the other thing is, of course, you know, in the aftermath of civil war, part of Taif Accord was that every militia was supposed to disarm. And every militia did disarm, except for the Shia, except for Hezbollah. Um, and so um, there really is an imbalance. Um, uh, so, you know, there are allegedly some Christian militia that, that the Lebanese forces has a small militia. There may be some, uh, some others. Um, the Sunnis don't really have much. Um, there's no militia. It's not unified. Uh, the Druze still have some, some militia or some, you know, protection forces up in, in the Shuf and LA, but um, it's not. It's not what it was. So um, I think everybody's very cautious about it and doesn't want to slip into that. And, and, you know, we talk about collapse, right? A failed state. Um, you know, the, nobody's making any money there. 85% of people below the poverty line. There's a World Bank social safety net program. The United States supporting 17% of $230 million project. You know, we're getting money directly to people because nobody gives the money to the government of Lebanon anymore for these things. It couldn't be counted on. The money would disappear um, into the, you know, into the abyss of corruption. But, um, you know, the people are still hungry, um, unhappy, um, but still living there. They're not being provided services. Um, the, but and if you work for the government, your salary isn't much of a salary anymore because you're being paid at that ridiculous rate of, uh, of uh, you know, for the currency. Um, but, uh, you know, what does a collapse look like? Well, uh, you know, this is not, you still have a military, you still have an ISF, uh, a police force, 
Um, and so in large part, I think because of, uh, there is external funding for uh, these institutions, even as problematic as they are, um, it hasn't deteriorated further. Thank you. Um, historically, GCC countries uh, have tried to stabilize the Lebanese state and the Lebanese economy. Are they still uh, trying? Do they still play that role or did they give up on Lebanon completely? Yeah, I mean, uh, the Saudis used to underwrite Saad um, the Sunni community of Lebanon, the government of Lebanon used to put billion dollar deposits in the central bank, et cetera. Um, you know, coincident with uh, I think the rise of MBS, um, uh, in Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, but also, I think, uh, you know, uh, this is coming for some time. I think the Saudis realized this wasn't a great investment um, and, uh, you know, don't want to play Lebanese politics like they did. Uh, hmm. You know, a lot of their money disappeared, didn't buy institutions, didn't buy even a Sunni militia that could protect Saad Hariri's house when Hezbollah invaded Beirut in 2008. Um, they couldn't even, you know, draw up, you know, two busloads of Sunnis from the north to come down and and protect the prime minister. Yeah, you know, the military disappeared. <laughs> they they weren't going to protect the prime minister. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't think they're prepared to do this. And in any event, um, you know, you just recently heard from Saudi Arabia that there's not going to be any more blank checks for Egypt either. Um, right. You know, Egypt is too big to fail. They got 105, 110 million billion uh, million people. Um, you know, I, I believe there still will be additional, you know, Gulf funding for that. Uh, Qatar put a couple billion in the central bank. Saudi puts in the central bank. The Emiratis do. Nobody wants to see it collapse and it's in terrible shape. Um, Lebanon, I think they, they're saying, well, you know, Hezbollah and Iran are really the dominant powers here. Um, we're not going to reverse that. Why would, you, why would we underwrite it? Let Iran underwrite it. Right. Um. It's very, I have to say, just as a, as, a, as a side note, that I personally, every time I hear um, anything about uh, Lebanon, um, it, it sounds uh, tragic and and ironic um, at the same time. Um, we have questions oh, about- Yes, sorry, it's absolutely tragic. I mean, uh, yeah. like I said, I, I, I before I went to the government, I, I don't think I can go for a little while now, but before I went to the government, I was going to Lebanon three times a year. Um, some of my best friends are Lebanese. Um, yeah. Hezbollah killed one of my best friends in Lebanon three weeks after I left government. Um, you know, it's, uh, it is tragic. And a lot of these people who are living there, making a living, fighting the good fight, um, finally decided, hey, I'm leaving to, you know, Abu Dhabi. I got to make money for my family. I can't afford to live here. I don't have any more dollars in my safe, right? I can't afford to be paid in, in lira and people, you know, give it up. Right. Um, all right. In light, in light of this question, in light of the economic difficulties that normal people are facing in the country, let's say that you're a Shia uh, Lebanese uh, Muslim with, who's loyal to Hezbollah. How better off are you from uh, from other people? How much economic aid or the economic networks of Hezbollah aids people in their daily life? Well, Hezbollah, um, because of Iran, um, has access to, to dollars. Um, mm -hmm. They're also... You know, uh, so let me go back here a little bit. Um, during the last administration, we engaged in what was called the maximum pressure campaign on Iran, tried to choke them out, um, put pressure on them to enter into a new deal <clears throat> that would actually, you know, like the Biden administration said, uh, longer and stronger, um, that also dealt with the, the funding of, um, you know, love it, uh, with regional militia um and uh you know proliferation um and advancement of uh the ballistic missile technology uh throughout the region and elsewhere in the world um uh during that period of time um hezbollah didn't have a whole lot of money right iran could not provide hezbollah with um the ability to fund its kindergartens uh to do all its subsidies to pay all the salaries of its workers its reserve forces uh, and so a lot of people ended up um, joining Hezbollah so that they could go fight in Syria, which were the only people that they were paying. Right? And a lot of these guys ended up getting killed and wounded, high, high rate of casualties there, uh, fighting uh, ISIS and uh, primarily fighting uh, opponents of the Assad regime, right? killing Sunnis, Palestinians, that kind of thing. Um, so 
um, back then they, they had some difficulties. Um, during that period, Hezbollah um, had to go and be entrepreneurial. And so, uh, you know, it was always entrepreneurial, but, but now even more so. And uh, they went into um, narco trafficking with the Assad regime as their partner. And so they have, you know, been a, a big part of the Captagon smuggling network. There's the amphetamines throughout the region, the world, um, other types of drugs as well. And they made some money out of, out of this. But you can go actually in, in Lebanon now to Shiite areas and go to this thing called Cardon Hassan and go to an ATM and get dollars, right? Mm. You have an account with these guys. This is one of the benefits that Hezbollah provides. But um, all these people, you know, Shiites work for the government. Shiites work for the military. Um, these people are being paid at that same terrible um, rate and they are suffering um, like everybody else um, in the country. Um, Hezbollah, you know, is not providing that kind of large ass, um, even now. Um, situation is not great for Iran, even though, you know, back in the Trump days, they were smuggling 300,000 barrels a day. Now they're smuggling a million. Um, you know, it's it's different, but Iran still is not in good economic shape and not able to provide Hezbollah with the, with the patrimony. So across the board, whether you're a Shiite, Sunni, or Christian, uh, or Druze, or, or uh, Protestant, you know, Cap, whatever, uh, things are terrible. Um, thank you. Um, last question. I want to ask all of our audience who, who uh, sent us questions. Um, in your opinion, is there a right strategy, uh, a right strategy towards Lebanon um, and what that should be? Uh, a right strategy? Listen, I, I think we have to play the long game. Right. Um, in the end of the day, uh, really, the only thing is that's going to have a, a negative pernicious impact uh, on Hezbollah um, is uh, what happens in Tehran, right? Um, if this clerical regime is destabilized, if um, if these protests in the long term work, I mean, you know, I think it, uh, uh, there has been uh, a, a dramatic change in Iran in terms of what people, uh, the legitimacy um, of the regime has been brought into question, um, you know, broadly in a way that it hasn't. And, you know, even if you go back to 2009, when the United States sided with the, the regime against the protesters, um, this wasn't, you know, this is, had been, um, you know, it's dying out now, the protests. But I think the sentiment about uh, hijab, about uh, the legitimacy, legitimacy uh, hijab is a symbol of the legitimacy of the, of the regime. All these things are being brought into question. Um, that we're a long way away from you know, a democratic Iran or a transition in Iran, even if Khamenei, who's 88 years old or something, uh, dies, you're going to have transition, but you're going to have transition not away from the theocratic regime or to either either you know more theocratic regime or the IRGC, right? This is not going to change Hezbollah's position, but I think over time, we got to play the long game. We got to be involved in Lebanon, um, continue to engage, work with people, um, but also have an understanding um, that, uh, you know, we're not going to win this anytime soon. And if we disappear, um, you know, and, and, and decide not to engage, um, then it only becomes uh, more and more Iranian. Um, and I don't think the majority of Lebanese want this. I think they want to have a normal country. I think they have remarkable joie de vivre. I think they are uh, Western oriented, uh, the vast majority of the people in the country. Uh, and so I, I think we have to have reasonable expectations about what we can accomplish, uh, but we should look for our opportunities to undermine Hezbollah. You know, uh, every time I talk, I talk about how this maritime uh, delineation uh, that the Biden administration secured, that was ultimately um, had the assent of Hezbollah, um, that Hezbollah is now Israel's business partner, right? They don't like to hear that, but this, you know, this is discrediting uh, this organization that now has admitted to the existence, if not recognition of the right to exist, of Israel. Um, you know, every time we can, you know, chip away at, at the 
legitimacy doctrine ideology of this organization we just take the opportunity to do so uh but we're not these people will not be vanquished anytime soon and while they are a significant threat to israel um uh israel doesn't want to tangle with them now either uh, they have a list of priorities that puts uh, the iranian nuclear program first and rightfully so but uh, sooner or later as Iran, as uh, Hezbollah progresses with their PGM program, their precision guided munitions, upgrading this 150,000 rockets, I think we're we're going to see that we're going to have a con another conflagration eventually. Um, I don't want to see that. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be a lot worse than 2006. Um, but uh, we got to stay involved, regardless of, of what happens. It's a it's a bellwether country and. Uh, and most of the people there, I believe, notwithstanding Hezbollah's dominance, share our values. Thank you so much, David, for your you know, lengthy um, history of experience and your you know hardly gained or a very difficultly gained wisdom, not only about Lebanon but about um, the entire Middle East, particularly the Levant. Um, and I would like to direct our listeners to please go to David's really wonderful article on the Washington Institute website, washingtoninstitute.org, uh, about Jordan, which is, again, another very, very troubling country. Um, and I'd like to say that um, in a world that's replete with so much misinformation, particularly right now about the state of Israel, um, uh, many of our listeners and Congress rely upon AMET to provide accurate facts and analyses um, for critical policy decisions about the Middle East. Um, with, with support from respected scholars such as David Schenker from the Washington Institute and many others and thought leaders, um, AMET is on the front lines daily. Um, offering timely nonpartisan education, most particularly on Capitol Hill. Um, our efforts have been successful in making impactful changes to ensure a, sort, a more secure future, hopefully, for the United States and for Israel. So we do depend on our listeners for your support. So please, if you can, go to www.ametonline.org um, and um, please. Um, help us if you like the kind of work that we do. And of course, please go to the Washington Institute website and also support the good work of the Washington Institute um, that has wonderful scholars such as David Shanker. Again, thank you so very much. And we will see you next week where we will have Itamar Mar Marcus from Palestinian Media Watch at our regular time on Wednesday at 12 o'clock talking about the horrific incitement that these, um, un unfortunately, that many, many Palestinian youth, if not all of them, have been subjected to. Um, thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.